today I'm driving something very special. Enzo Ferrari called it the most beautiful car in the world and he was quite angry it wasn't one of his. Yes, I'm driving an E-Type and it's a Series 1. Well, there aren't many cars that literally don't need an introduction. Do I even need to tell you what this is? But I suppose I probably should do in case you're watching with the uh, screen turned off or something. This is a 1966 E-Type Jaguar 4.2 fixed head coupe 2 plus 2. Lots of words and letters there. There's a bit of debate in E-Type circles as to what is peak E-Type. Is it an early 3.8 flat 4 or is it when the 4.2 finally came out and gave you proper foot space and a better gearbox? For my money, it's the 4.2. It's a much nicer car to drive, a little bit more practical. Let's have a look around and see what we think. After the war, Jaguar is making amazing progress, developing faster and faster cars for racing and the road. And the XK engine had been developed extraordinarily in the XK120 series of cars. Now, following a couple of prototypes in the late 50s, in 1961, this, the E-Type, was finally launched in the world. It was the product of two key designers, the engineer and the guy who drew the outside shape of it. Now, the iconic shape is what everyone thinks of instantly when they see this car, the long bonnet, the far back set cabin, that long sloping tail, these curves everywhere. But all that was actually kind of predestined and preset in a way by the work of Tom Jones, not that one. The engineer whose early workings had positioned the wheels, he positioned the steering, he positioned the hard points underneath the skin, which the designer Malcolm Sayer then clothed with this fabulous work of art. Now Malcolm Sayer had worked with the Bristol Aircraft Company during the Second World War and he brought with him a lot of aircraft technology and innovation involving things like monocoque construction, aluminium skins, that kind of stuff. So from the bulkhead backwards it's a single monocoque tub here giving loads of strength and rigidity to the car and the rear suspension, the rear independent suspension is mounted on a separate subframe which is actually made of square box section which looks really crude when you see it up close and at the front of the car this whole under the skin area looks incredibly crude and a bit like it's been sort of lashed together in a you know, school woodwork shop or something, well metalwork really I suppose. And of course it works beautifully. It's got some great innovations like disc brakes all around. Jaguar had trial disc brakes on their saloon so it had to come on here really didn't it? And this design has stood up to the test of time almost better than anything else I can think of. I mean, really there's this, the Mini, the Series 1 Land Rover. Nothing else really looks as timeless. But let's have a look under the bonnet at that amazing engine. Now lifting this bonnet is one of the most traumatic things any car owner can ever do because as this end goes up, that end goes down and it gets very close to the ground and if you are by a curb, by a rock, by a duck, then you have the potential to impact the front of your bonnet. The last time I checked the price of one of these was about 2011 and back then it was four grand for a new bonnet. I think they've gone up since then so I'd be very keen not to damage it if it was mine. Anyway, with it up in the air you have its unfettered access to this amazing XK engine. It gained a 4.2 litre XK up on the old 3.8. Bizarrely the power figures and acceleration in 0 to 60 and top speed are all virtually the same. 0 to 60 in 7 seconds, top speed 150. The difference is with the extra bit of torque the power is easier to use. With the bonnet up you can see more clearly this subframe which is bolted to the bulkhead of the monocoque tub behind it and it looks so crude so basic it looks almost homemade but this is the architecture of this car. Around the back of the car there's a similar thing holding the rear suspension together with the inboard rear discs, the twin uh, shocks on either side. It's a very very clever and complicated bit of engineering. Normally this would come with three SU carburetors from the factory but this has been upgraded to Webers at some point in history. Now the E-Type is actually an early kind of innovative hatchback because this rear door on the car actually opens sideways, not usefully vertically but sideways. There is no obvious way of actually accessing this boot, it's very very flush, very streamlined, very, very pretty. There's actually a hidden catch on the back of this panel here, so to lean in the driver's door, pull it and then open this like a car bonnet almost with a little tag inside there and the thing pops open. It's not massively deep. I mean, this point here is, it's that deep. It's at about six centimeters or so at the back and maybe 10 centimeters at the front. Um, so it's pretty shallow in there. It's okay for a couple of weekend away bags, but if your weekend goes badly wrong and you've got to shift a body, you're going to struggle to hide it because it's barely going to fold up in there. And there's no load cover as well. And so everyone's going to see what you've got hidden in the back straight to the big rear window. Curiously, this particular car has a button marked rear window on the dashboard. 
Um, but as this has no rear wiper, no rear washer, and no rear heating element, we're a bit mystified as to what exactly that's for. There's no curtain light, no loudspeakers. There is a spare wheel under the floor, but that's your lot. It's kind of practical for a sports car. Well, one thing you do really notice when you climb into an E-Type is the size of the sill. It's really, really very wide and very high. It's structural, so it gives the car lots of rigidity, but it's not the most dainty and elegant thing to climb in and out of. And luckily, I'm not wearing a short skirt today. You can tell people were smaller back in the 60s, I mean, but I'm not a massive person, but even for me, this is kind of tight. There's not much elbow room. Fortunately, there is actually an elbow pad here to rest on, so there's a bit of space between you and your passenger. But uh, yeah, even though the steering wheel falls perfectly to hand, and the pedals, although tight around your feet, are nicely placed, it's all quite constricting. Um, I've not got much space around my feet at all. If, ideally, I should have worn like racing shoes or, I don't know, something tiny really on my feet. These boots aren't the best for it. This transmission tunnel is massive. If you've ever been in a C4 or C3 Corvette, it's reminiscent of that, where the transmission is just so big. It's bigger than the actual car itself. It's ridiculous. But let's have our usual walk around. We've got a nice elbow resting door handle here on the door itself, which is a useful pull. But it's big metal door handles for opening and closing there. Manual windows, obviously, because British sports cars didn't have electric windows until much later on. And right in front of you, you've got this fabulous, big, thin-rimmed, wooden-rimmed steering wheel. It's a typical Jaguar sports car wheel of the 50s, 60s, and it's just so elegant. You have the Jaguar face, the Leaper, staring at you from this checkered flag because Jaguar was still making a big thing of Villa Mornwinds back in the 50s. Interesting fact, only two car manufacturers use an animal face pointing straight out of the badge at you because most companies think it's uh, too confrontational and too, too angry. It's Jaguar, wanna take a guess at the other one? No, it's Dodge, the Ram. Yeah, you've learned something today. That's all you're gonna learn. Now looking through these thin spokes, you've got these wonderful dials. They are huge and clear. And the 160 mile an hour tag here on the speedometer, that is a really, really significant big thing to write home about. Because virtually nothing could do 150 in the early 60s. 1961 when this car came out, that was like a Bugatti doing 300 today, but, but bigger. This is the moon landing in a car. Not the moon landing in a car, this is as big as the moon landing, but, but in a car. You know where I'm going with this. So here to the left of the speedo, we've got our Taco. It red lines at five, which is quite interesting because the uh, tech spec books say that the peak power is 5.4. So you're well into your danger zone by the time you're hitting the maximum power out of this engine. We have one little curious little switch here, rear window. A little on off pull with a yellow light next to it. And I'm mystified by this because basically there's nothing on the rear window as I mentioned a minute ago. So I don't know what that's all about. Now below that, you've got our brake fluid and handbrake warning light. So when the handbrake's on and the ignition's on, that glows red. And if your brake fluid all falls out, it does as well. Even the steering wheel is pretty spindly. This stalk is even spindlier. So it's quite well hidden by the wheel itself. This is the indicators here on the right-hand side of the column. And just a finger tip length away, your headlamp dip switch is just over there on the right-hand side as well. Now the central panel of this is Amazing, it's uh, common to most Jaguars in the 60s and the, this whole period, they kind of follow this design theme pretty religiously. But you can tell that Malcolm Sayer came from the aircraft industry because this looks like the dashboard of a plane. All these toggle switches in a nice neat row, which are actually kind of hard to find. Fortunately, this one here says map on it, and that's your map light, which illuminates your dashboard. And they're unmarked apart from a little tiny, well, virtually a Dymo label here underneath. Um, so you need to know the car fairly well if you're going to drive it in the dark. Things like your wiper slow and fast setting, no delay. It's beautifully elegant. And these are four little dials here for amps, fuel, oil and water. Again, all just nice symmetrical mirroring themselves. Looking very pretty with the, the main headlight and side light switch here above. Looking like some kind of control from a plane. And to either side of it, you've got these wonderful, in fact, these are just ripped straight off the, the throttle controls from virtually any aircraft you care to name. The chokers on your right-hand side, these are your cabin heater and blower controls. Over to the far left, you've got the tiniest glove box I think I've ever seen. And for your passenger's benefit, because there are seat belts fitted, um, not sure many people would have bothered to wear them in the early 60s, there's a grab handle so you don't fall out the window when you're 
cornering very hard indeed, which is something that would have happened a lot. Notable in its absence is any kind of usable tea shelf. Um, we're not gonna put a mug of tea on here because that's soft and I don't wanna mark any types dash top. Uh, there's a little shelf cubby hole thing here, but that's never gonna fit a cup of anything in there whatsoever. And uh, this is three days of Starbucks drive through so you're not gonna have any cup holders down here, even though it's actually perfectly sized. If there was anyone of a mind to do it, an aftermarket thing for an E-Type would be a, a cup holder version of this little uh, console here. I might see if that's a thing I can put into. I'm copywriting that, don't steal it. Here below all the switches, we've got a Motorola radio, which looks very period indeed. It's a push button pre-select type, um, which is, I think, medium wave and long wave. So yeah, probably as early 60s, maybe as an update in the 70s perhaps, but it, it's definitely not recent. And the 4.2 gained synchro mesh on all gears, which is a major step up from the old original 3.8, which only had synchro on the, the upper speeds. The old Moss crash box was a, well, let's be honest, it was a horrible thing to use, but people pay premium for cars with it in, but frankly, I would be glad to have that synchro box, but this car, being a rental car as it is, um, actually has a five-speed box added, so it's even more drivable and much more usable. And behind that, we've got this big chrome handbrake with a quite unusually designed um, button on the end, which is actually possible to catch your finger in and hurt a little bit. So instead of being a button inside the end of this um, kind of column, it's uh, like a shroud on the outside, so it moves backwards and just pinches your skin if you're not careful. Behind that, we do actually have, quite unusually for a 1960s car, a little cubby hole, which is uh, pretty handy. And also it gives you a nice little elbow pad when you're driving. So you can lean and say, I say, in your best Terry Thomas impression. Now these seats, although they're quite small, aren't too uncomfortable. Although the back rest doesn't come very high. There's no headrest. They don't lock in place. Okay, these are terrible seats. What am I saying? Forget I started that sentence. <laughs> Moving into the back, this is a two plus two. So there are vestigial seats of a kind. They're pretty small, but if you've got kids, you kidnap some kids, I don't know, they'll fit in the back. There's no seat belts back there because 1960s, but there is a pop-out window for a bit of ventilation. Now this car has got a Webasto sunroof fitted. I'm not gonna open it in case I can't shut it again. I don't know if this was standard or not on a car of 1966. It may have been a factory option. Stick it in the, co in the comments because I'd be curious to know whether a car of this vintage would have had a Webasto sunroof as standard. I know they were built then, but whether they came from the factory, I don't know. Right, let's take you for a drive. Now, to start one of these things, you need to look at some of these various barely marked things. You'll find the ignition key, and this little tiny thing here is the ignition key. It's like the boot key on a Rover from this period. Flick the key and push the starter. And we're away. All right, when you're sitting in this thing, these mirrors are not the best. There's a truck coming though, so I'm gonna... This is a great thing to drive. What an engine! This car is available to rent right now from the New Forest Classic Hire next to Bewley Motor Museum down in the New Forest. Beautiful car, beautiful location, about 200 quid a day, and they've got an Austin Healy you can take out as well. Give them a call, the link's in the details below. The engine in this car, the famous XK engine, is just such a magnificent piece of engineering, and it's what gives this car so much character. It just sounds like nothing else. It sounds like a fighter plane. And it just wants to be driven. As I mentioned in looking at the TACO earlier, it redlines really low, but you don't need to be accelerating it very hard and revving it very high to get all the power. It kicks in at such a low RPM. Like we're cruising around doing 40 miles an hour now in fourth gear at about 1500. It's just nuts. And this spindly little, it, indicator stalk is extremely easy to use. It's just exactly a fingertip point. But that's what you want to hear about. You don't want to drive a new type and hear about the indicators. You want to hear about what it's like on the road. Well, I can tell you it's fantastic. It's an alive thing. It's an animal of a car which is living and breathing and talking to you all the time. asking me to drive it all the way to the Alps right now. It wants me to be new Norman Dewis and just head for the ferry and just go just 11 hours non-stop all the way to Switzerland. As I'm sure you've heard, if you're watching this you probably know about E-Types anyway, everyone does, everyone loves them. Norman Dewis drove 
11 hours overnight to Geneva, to the grounds of a Hotel de Vivre or something it was called, in order to have a show car ready to show the world because the press couldn't get enough of them. And the steering on this thing is horrible when you're in a car park. Trying to manoeuvre this thing out of anywhere you've stopped for petrol or getting in for the first time, it's quite daunting because it's not power assisted, there's a lot of weight from the engine over the front end, and trying to just shift it and manoeuvre it at sub five miles an hour is a sweat inducing experience. But the moment you get on the road, you get above sort of 15, 20, it comes alive. There's no power assistance to interrupt the experience of feeling what the car is doing. And so it's just a totally electric connectedness, it's telepathic. The only thing I've driven close to one of these really would be a Renault Alpine from the 70s or 60s, which also has a similar kind of direct, uninterrupted feel straight to the road. But when you are sitting in here, this, that view down the bonnet is just unique. And maybe a Ferrari Dino comes close that nothing else is quite as, as long and voluptuous. It, it's ridiculous how far back you are in the car. Uh, if you're at a T-junction, it's actually quite quite dangerous, really. From Police Academy, high tower, and you couldn't fit in the car, so it pulls up the front seats and climbs in the back. That's kind of how you feel when you're driving one of these. You're high tower in the back of your E-Type. We got what's the junction? It's a 4. Point, what's a 4.2 litre, 4355 cc, I think seven bearing. It's a beast of a thing with so much torque. It really pulls the car rapidly, 0 to 60 on these in about seven seconds, which is fantastic even for a car today, never mind back in the 60s when it was just earth shatteringly quick. Now they claim this did 150 miles an hour. It's, a grain of truth in that. The press car did 150 miles an hour. 9600 HP and 77 RW. Um, may have had a little help from the factory with maybe a slightly different gearing, slightly lighter bodywork, maybe a bit breathed on. Um, and they did manage to make 150, 151, I think, in a couple of tests. Motorsport magazine with Bill Body at the wheel managed to hit 155 down the M1 before there were, there were speed limits, I hasten to add. So even by today's standards, this is still a very rapid car. And it feels it. It just wants to go. We're in, down in the, the New Forest at the moment and the limits are pretty low. The roads are beautiful and straight and you just want to just drop a gear and floor it, but the chances are a pony will walk out in front of you. Which is not to be good. It was incredibly advanced at its time. We're going sweeping through s bends like we're about to right now. The car does grip beautifully well. Independent suspension all round. Very, very controlled body, very stiff body. Very soft suspension. For a modern sports car, this is wallowy and soft, but for a 60s car, this is, well, it's quite hard, it's wrong, really. It's actually kind of a beautiful compromise because you can still get the handling. The car will throw through a corner and grip incredibly well, but it's lovely and comfortable. If you want to drive this all the way to the south of France, which is perfect for, then uh, it's not going to give you a bad back or, you know, bust any, any vertebrae doing it. It's just bang on for that. <laughs> Although, if you were to hit the, uh, the south of France in one go, you'd be stopping fairly frequently because the MPG on one of these is 17, 18. A bit worse if you're hoofing it. But it's a 4.2 litre straight six. So, hey. The visibility on this thing is just phenomenal because these A pillars, B pillars, C pillars, they're just tiny and spindly and there's loads of glass area. But the mirrors themselves, this central one is not bad, but these side ones, I've just about adjusted something out of that. But the one on the left, I can see virtually nothing out of. As you pull away, the sound from the engine, it's somewhere between a spitfire on a truck, but in a good way. But I, love, I, I could happily drive one of these cars all day and never go above about 35, just stopping and then pulling away, making it into second gear and then pulling away again. Okay, so as well as independent suspension all round, this has got disc brakes all round. It was used extensively by Jaguar in their previous car, so they really had to carry on with that in this car as well. 
and uh, for a car of the 60s, it stops amazingly well. Okay, compared to say a brand new car, it's not as good, so you do need to be a little bit wary. But, for an old car, it's pretty damn good. Oh, that noise, that noise is just phenomenal. Oh, this is so good. We need a motorway for this car, a motorway with no speed limit on it to go very fast indeed. Yeah, the scariest thing about driving this car really is that bonnet, just being aware of it is just so far out in front of you and it's kind of slightly vulnerable, so you really don't want to be risking it at any time. You've got to be careful at junctions, careful when you're parking and careful on big speed humps even. I should say, if, if you're concerned or curious as to whose legs these are in the corner of the shot, which you might see in the GoPro over there, you can't see them on the Nikon, this is Joseph Lloyd of, of, from off of Tweed Jacket Reviews and Lloyd's Vehicle Consulting, who is sharing this drive with me today. Oh, this thing is just phenomenal. I can't get enough of just the low down grunt of this car. It's like driving an electric vehicle because all the grunt comes in just at no revs and then it just carries on. Well, okay, then it stops being like an electric car because it, it runs out of puff around 5,000. Whereas an electric car just keeps on going. But this is fabulous. It's a real visceral experience driving this car. You're so part of it. It's not like driving a new car. Old cars obviously always are more involved. You have to work harder to get something back from them and they don't forgive fools lightly. But a car like this, it's not too hard really. But it just wants to drive, it wants to be driven. It's a typical 60s car though because there's not enough leg room, there's not enough knee room. There's no way to put your cups of tea after they did the first two prototypes, the A, A1E, I think it was called, an A2E, or something like that. I'll, I'll put a correction in the, in the script below. Tom Jones, the engineer, only expected to be making 270 or so, or 250 cars in total. Anyway, about 15 years later, they knocked out 70,000 of these things. And 80% of those went to America. Of course, by the time it went to the Series 3 and the V12, it was almost unrecognisable. It wasn't a sports car anymore, it was a GT. The world had changed, the market had changed. But if you're after a British muscle car, it's kind of this or a Jensen, really, isn't it? And I think I prefer this to the Jensen, to be perfectly honest. It might not have the thumping V8. It's a little bit more British, a bit more refined, a bit more cad-like, whereas the, uh, the Jensen's a bit more baloosh. Oh, okay, at idle, it's not too bad, but as soon as you hit that throttle! What a noise! It's like a Spitfire on four wheels! Oh, what a great noise! Love this car! You can hear, you can almost feel the fuel sucking through the triple Webers. It's, it's astonishing. If you are into cars, you need to do two things. You need to own an Alfa Romeo, you need to drive an E-Type. Then you've earned your badge of honor, your wings, if you like. You can call yourself a true car enthusiast then. You don't need to own an E-Type because you'd have to be a rich car enthusiast to do that. It's a slightly different thing. When I was researching this last night, I was reading a book from 2011, which is the 50th anniversary of the car. And at the time, E-Type values were only starting to rise up a bit. And I almost spat my tea across the room when I read, you will now have to pay around £20,000 for a good Series 1 E-Type. Oh, 20 grand? That's a bonnet! Once again, I don't want to give this car back. Still got nearly half a tank of petrol. I could go quite a long way on that. They'd never find me. Yeah, they're pretty wood. They just even laughing quite a long way off. <laughs> yeah, I got e type. Yeah. Well, thanks for watching and coming along for a ride in this piece of automotive royalty. This really is something special. It's one of those cases where they say never meet your heroes, but I think in this case, you'd be fine. This is just a wonderful thing to be in. It's just so smooth, so relaxing, but so powerful and so connected at the same time. Being in this car has been just 
a dream come true for, for a day out. If you've not hit like and subscribe already, then please do. It makes a massive difference to the channel. I do very much appreciate it. And join me again next time when I won't be in any type again, but it'll be something good. So I'll see you again soon.